everyone, and thank you for joining today's program, Exploring Treatment Options for Kidney Cancer. This is Judy Chandler from Inspire, and we are thrilled to have Dr. Eric Yonash and Dr. Matthew Campbell with us today from MD Anderson to talk about kidney cancer treatment. We'd also like to thank the Kidney Cancer Association for co-sponsoring today's event with Inspire. I'm now pleased to introduce our program moderator, Mike Lawing. Mike is a tireless patient advocate who serves as a volunteer group leader for the Kidney Cancer Association Inspire Support Community. He is also known to many of you by his Inspire screen name, Nick Girl. We greatly appreciate all that Mike has done to support this incredible community of patients and caregivers affected by kidney cancer. And before I pass it on to Mike, we are getting some questions about whether or not the program will be available after this event, and we will be sending out a copy of the archived presentation so you can watch it after the event. And I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Mike. Thanks. Thank you, Judy. I'm Mike Lowing, and I'm now in my 18th year of cancer survivorship. I'm active in cancer advocacy and awareness programs at the local through the international levels, and I'm happy to be here today as your program moderator. I would like to begin by introducing our two speakers, Dr. Eric Yonash and Dr. Matthew Campbell. Dr. Yonash is an associate professor in the Department of Genitourinary Medical Oncology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Yonash also serves as a member of the Key Cancer Association's Medical Advisory Board and as a member of VHL Alliance Board of Directors. Dr. Matthew Campbell is an assistant professor at the University of Texas MD Anderson. For the past three years, he was a chief medical oncology fellow, and last year he served as the chief fellow. Dr. Campbell is the recipient of the 2015 ASCO Conquer Cancer Foundation Young Investigator Award, which is funded by the Kidney Cancer Association. He is also a survivor of early stage melanoma. Now, before we begin, I would like to go over a few housekeeping items. We will hold a question and answer session at the end of the program. You can submit your question to us at any time by going to the gray Q&A button in the upper left portion of your computer screen and sending your questions directly to us. Please remember that our presenters will only be able to answer questions of a general nature and cannot make any specific recommendations. The Q&A button can also be used to let us know if you're having any trouble hearing or viewing the program. And finally, if you're not currently a member of the KCA Inspire Support Community, we encourage and invite you to join by visiting kidneycancer.inspire.com. And now I'd like to hand the program over to Dr. Eric Yonash to begin his presentation. Dr. Yonash? Thank you very much, and uh, thank you to the KCA um, for the privilege of being able to give this presentation today uh, and to my duty for moderating. So what I'm going to be talking about today really is going to be treatment options for kidney cancer in 2015. And uh, here are my disclosure uh, data uh, with regards to uh, whom I've been working with um, to develop compounds in renal cell carcinoma. Uh, the talks I'm going to cover today include approaches to the first, second, and third line of treatment for metastatic renal cell carcinoma. I'm also going to talk about best practices for managing the side effects, which inevitably come with these agents. We're going to have Matthew Campbell talk about some of the latest research on checkpoint-inhibiting antibodies, and then I'm going to talk at the end about genetic kidney cancer syndromes and ask the question of who is it that really would need to be tested for these. So some terminology. Kidney cancer, renal cell carcinoma, RCC are interchangeable. At least they are in this particular presentation, and I will be using those interchangeably. Progression-free survival is a term that's used usually when we're looking at response to treatment and asking the question, how long does it take for the, the disease to start growing again while on this treatment? And overall survival is the time it takes from the start of treatment to the passing away of the patient while on, on, on treatment. It's important to bear in mind that kidney cancer or renal cell carcinoma is a number of different tumor subtypes. And the one that we focus on, or we're going to be focusing on most today is clear cell renal cell carcinoma in light of the fact that it's the most common and most of the agents that we've been using have been used to test this. And we're going to talk a little bit about papillary and chromophobe with regards to how we would approach them. 
as you can see here in the circled area, clear cell has a VHL mutation. And when we look at what VHL does, VHL is a very important protein inside all cells, which will regulate whether or not it uh, is able to, to respond to low oxygen levels. And a VHL mutation will mimic low oxygen state in the tumor cell. And what that does is it results in a cell that actually and falsely is saying that it lacks oxygen, that it needs more blood supply, and it needs more blood vessels. And this is one of the reasons why renal cell carcinoma has so many blood vessels um, in it. Um, and these happen to be a good target for a number of the therapies that we use. Important point is when we are treating renal cell carcinoma, we're treating an organ. We're treating here in this next slide the cancer cells, which are in black. We have the red lines, which are the endothelial cells or the blood vessel cells. We have stromal cells in the middle, which can be immune cells and a variety of other cells. And these, in this interaction between in this organ is what we're trying to target. The anti-antigenic or blood vessel starving agents that we use include sunitinib, pazopinib, bevacizumab, serafinib, and excitinib, and these are all called Sutan, Votriant, Avastin, Nexavar, and Enlita. And in this situation, the tumor cell produces VEGF, which you see in the arrow on the right of your slide, which then feeds these new blood vessels that are in the tumor. And these drugs actually will block these nutrients from helping these blood vessels grow. In this way, we break blood vessels down and we hopefully hurt the tumor. We also have another major class of drugs called mammalian target of rapamycin inhibitors or mTOR inhibitors. And these are, include temsorolimus and everolimus or toracil and affinitor. And in this situation here now, we have a blow up of the cancer cell. We have some signaling inside the cell that helps the cell move faster and grow faster. And you can see here in this where toracil and affinitor are blocking mTOR. This prevents protein production and survival signals within the tumor cell. It doesn't kill the cell exactly, but it slows down. When we think about metastatic kidney cancer, we have to think a little bit about how does the disease itself affect the patient as well as the treatment. And this is very important because in 2015, some of these factors that these disease-related factors or tumor-related factors will affect prognosis or the probability of survival at least as much as the treatments themselves. And even back in the late 1990s, uh, Dr. Mozart at Memorial Sloan Kettering put together this algorithm where a couple of different factors, including what are, we call quote-unquote performance status, how well the patient's doing, the red cell count, the calcium level, the LDH, which is a liver enzyme, plus the uh, time from treatment to, to diagnosis to treatment. And putting these together allows us to get a general sense of how a person's going to do. And this is something that you would want to discuss, perhaps, with your, with your physician. But these are important factors when we think about which treatments to give to what types of patients, and I'll talk about them more later. This table is a table that summarizes where we use most of these drugs. And so here we have on the top, I've circled first-line therapy, which we're going to be focusing on, and these risk stratifications that I've talked about, good or immediate risk versus poor risk, and we have some of the drugs that are used based on good phase three data, sunitinib, bevacizumab, Zopinib in the good or intermediate risk, and then in the poor risk feature, patients frontline temps relievemus or Toracel. And then an alternative, which I won't talk about much today, just in the interest of time, is hydrocentralucan 2. So let's talk a little bit about some of these main blood vessel starving or anti angiogenic drugs that we use. So Sutent or Sunitinib was FDA approved in 2006, and the reason it was approved was because in a large state where 750 patients received either a sunitinib or sutent or interferon, which is an immunotherapy, an older-fashioned immunotherapy, we saw that the progression-free survival was, was much, much better. That's the line on top that you see, the sort of brownie line as opposed to the green line, showing that the time it took for the disease to start growing again was longer with people on sutent compared to interferon which resulted in the approval of this drug, and it's one of the most commonly used drugs for kidney cancer patients. Now, one of the things challenges with Sutent have been how that it's been 
challenging a little bit from a tolerability perspective. And I'll talk about that a little bit more. But we recently published some papers showing that if we give this two weeks on and one week off, instead of four weeks on and two weeks off, we end up actually making people feel better and they actually um, stay on the drug longer. So it's a, it's a much better um, approach that we believe is, 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 is useful for patients. So the next drug that I'm going to talk about is Votriant or Pazopinib. And this is FDA approved in 2009. And it's another pill form therapy. And it was approved because of the fact that, once again, in looking at progression-free survival, or PFS, compared to placebo in this study, which was rather controversial, but interestingly, but you see the orange line on these tables, which uh, are, are higher, which suggests that the time it took for the disease to start progressing on patients who are on Votrian was considerably longer than placebo. And based on this, again, um, this was a, a drug that was FDA approved and is used quite frequently now in the United States. The um, next drug that I would talk about is, is Avast and Revacizumab. And this is actually different from the first two drugs, which are pill form. Avastin is an IV, and it was FDA approved in 2009 on the basis, again, of, of longer progression-free survival for people who got Avastin. In this case, situation, it's plus interferon versus interferon alone, and we had a 10-month progression-free survival versus a 5-month progression-free survival. And so these, these drugs, again, are showing time and time again that they delay the time that it takes for the, for the disease to start progressing. And one of the important questions you're probably asking yourself is that nice, but what about survival? And I'm not going to present survival data, but what we're seeing is when we look at groups of individuals in the last four or five years who have been treated with these drugs compared to groups of individuals who were treated 10 or 15 years ago with the old immunocytokine therapies, that the average survival, the median overall survival of people in this day and age is considerably better than what we were seeing. So we're definitely also improving the overall survival of patients. So the next drug in this class of anti-angiogenic or blood vessel starving drug to talk about is serafinib or Nexavar. Nexavar is another pill form anti-angiogenic drug. And it was actually the first drug that was FDA approved for, for kidney cancer in 2005 in this class. And this was on the basis of a study where people who had been previously treated with other drugs um, were then compared between serafinib and placebo. And the median progression-free survival here, again, that I took for the disease of progressing is the orange line you see here for, 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 for serafinib or Nexavar, uh, which was considerably better than the placebo so again, this was what resulted in the FDA approval. But the reason we're not using Nexavar quite as much in the first line is then there were some follow-up studies done which said, all right, this worked well in people who've been previously treated with, with interferon or interleukin. What about when we try this in people who had not been previously treated with anything? And this trial was a randomized study, meaning that there was a computer-generated flip of coin. 50% of the patients got Nexavar, serafinib. 50% of them got interferon. And then we looked at the progression-free survival. And in this study, and these curves you see here, we see that the, these curves are now overlapping quite heavily. And so this suggests that, that the, there was really no difference between next of our and the old-fashioned interferon, which was quite different from some of the other drugs that we saw. And this reason, next of our is not used quite as much as, as, as the other agents. Does that mean next of our is a bad drug? No, but it just seems that there might be some slightly more potent choices out there. So all of the drugs that I talked about up until now have been anti-angiogenic or blood vessel starving drugs. Now I'm going to move on to one of the mTOR inhibitors. And the first one I'm going to talk about is Toracel. Now, you may remember from the, uh, the, the table that I showed that Toracel was approved in, uh, in the basis of individuals who had some of these poor risk features, meaning or higher risk features uh, with the, either low hemoglobin or high LDH or high calcium. Um, and this is a study that was then done asking the question of whether Toracel was better than interferon or the combination of lower doses of Toracel plus interferon in patients who had some of these high-risk features. This study is a little bit different. It was overall survival. That was the primary endpoint. And the green line on top, the green curve, is actually the overall survival for people who are on Toracel. And this was 
what we call statistically significant, meaning it was a, this was probably not due to chance. And so we have here an agent that, that looks promising in this uh, high-risk um, group of, of individuals and was FDA approved for, for all comers, but we commonly use it in this particular setting. So is there a best drug in the first-line setting? The, the answer really is is no. I mean, different people may be a candidate for different drugs, and there are you know, side effect profiles in each of these that might be more favorable for one candidate of indivi one individual versus another. But at the end of the day, it's pretty clear that Suta and Botriant are the most commonly used drugs, and and most of the doctors out in the community are most experienced with these. And experience really matters when it comes to dealing with patients, helping them with the side effects of these agents. So all of these drugs that we've talked about up, up until now are drugs that have been tested in the first-line setting mainly, meaning that this was the first drug that patients received after they developed metastatic disease. And now we're going to talk about second line. So what happens after you progress, after the first line of, of treatment? Um, and... Uh, we are now going to talk about the, the second-line treatments where we have um, prior uh, cytokine uh, therapy or prior VEGF receptor inhibitors, meaning some of these other agents that we talked about. And the big thing that we want to focus on here are excitinib or Enlita um, and Afinitor um, or Everolimus. So and these are drugs that really have been mainly found to be um, beneficial in this second-line setting. So let's talk a little bit about these drugs. So first, we have um, Afitor or Everolimus. This is a pill form therapy. Uh, it's given once daily. It was approved in 2009. We're actually a number of you, if you sort of noticed, a couple of other drugs that were approved in 2009. It was a good year for kidney cancer therapies. And in this study, what, what, what happened is people who had previously been either on, on Sudent or Nexavar were given either Afinitor or Placebo. And in this study, the progression for survival for individuals who were on Afinitor uh, was considerably better than the patients who were on the placebo. And although the survival was not different between the two, that was because most patients ended up actually getting on Afinitor who were on the placebo arm once they progressed or gone onto other drugs um, later on. So Afinitor definitely is a commonly used drug in the second-line setting. Um, it's fairly well tolerated. It has a couple of side effects, but uh, it's a drug that, that, that the doctors in the community have a lot of experience with. Enlita, or excitinib, is another one of these anti-angiogenic blood vessel starving agents. And this was FDA approved in 2012 in the second-line setting. And this study... There was a slightly different design again where excitinib or Enlita was compared to uh, Nexavar and the progression survival at time progression was, was better for um, Enlita or excitinib than it was for, for Nexavar or Serafinib. And, and that's some, um, a, um, uh, one of the reasons why this, why this drug is commonly used uh, in the second, uh, second line setting. So once again, the question you're going to ask is, is one better than the other? And the answer is no head-to-head -head comparison has ever been done between Affinitor and Enlita. The answer is we don't know. What we do know is if you look at the numbers in terms of the time, the progression-free survival for each of these agents, they're pretty similar. Uh, now, the side effects are profiles are different, so this is a, something that you definitely want to have a conversation with your doctor about with regards to which one might be more suited to you. So what about third-line patient uh, treatments? So any of the drugs that I've talked about now, you could certainly, if you've gone through one and you've gone through another, you can try one of these third-line patients. It's always worth it to try another drug because I've had a number of patients in my practice where, where we, we keep on trying and we finally land something that seems to really work uniquely well. All of these drugs are a little bit different and everyone's tumor is a little bit different. So I really am a strong advocate of keeping on trying different lines of treatment. Now, um, one of the other questions that people ask is, well, if one drug is good, why not combine them? What about combinations and sequences? And the bottom line is that combinations, for the large part, with the exception of the interferon plus, um, uh, plus Avastin, have not really been, been FDA approved or have not really been shown to improve outcome. So sequences are what are being tested in a number of clinical trials. And so the question then is, whether or not should we always be starting with an anti-angiogenic or blood vessel or TKI drug in the frontline set, or could we start with an mTOR inhibitor like Phenitor? A big study that was published um, early 
last year asked that question where we had patients starting either with Sutent, moving on to a Fetor, or starting with a Fenitor and moving on to Sutent, and looking at the overall progression for survival. And in this study, it looked like the old-fashioned way of doing things, starting with Sutent and then moving on to a Fenitor, was the better choice. And first of all, just in the frontline setting, Sutent had a better progression-free survival at the top yellow line over the Affinitor, which is on the bottom orange line. So Sutent seems to be a little more potent than Affinitor in the front setting. And if you then look at the combined progression-free survival, it looks like starting with Sutent and moving to Affinitor gives you a better combined progression-free survival compared to the Affinitor followed by Sutent. So the old-fashioned way, starting with Sutent or Botrint or what have you, and moving on to uh, in LIDA or uh, Finitor type of uh, approach is what we still are practicing now. The overall survival also seemed to be moving in the in the right direction uh, for the for the uh, Sutent followed by Finitor in this trial. We have a current a trial that we've completed recently, not accruing patients anymore, where we're asking similar sequencing questions, and we hope to get these re- results out in the near future. So the conclusion for sequencing is that. For most patients, starting with one of these anti-angiogenic TAI drugs like Gotrin, Sutin, and others is best. And then in terms of what's the best second-line treatment, that w- what we know is that Affinitor is good. We know that Enlida is good. Um, if any of these are not available, moving to any of the other anti-angiogenic drugs seems to be uh, a good thing. Now, I didn't include the slides for this, but using Toracel in the second-line setting um, seems not to be as good a choice. And there was a trial that was done comparing Toracel to Nexavar, where it looked like the progression-free for survival was the same, but Nexavar seemed to do better than Toracel. So Toracel is not a drug I use a lot in the second or third line setting. So what about dealing with side effects and quality of life issues? I mean, this is obviously a huge deal here. Um, people hopefully are going to be on these drugs for a long period of time, and we need to make sure we optimize the quality of life. And so, key points. Number one, you need to have open lines of communication with your treating team. And key point number two is you need to be an empowered patient. So what do I mean about that? So, you know, I've been a practitioner for a number of years now, and I know we're getting busier and busier, and it's sometimes challenging to be able to communicate with patients in between visits, but it's really, really important. Doctors and nurses and the nurse practitioners need to know what's going on with the patient. And then the other side of it, the patient really needs to be able to provide information to the doctor in terms of what's going on. Um, the other aspect of it is empowerment. And what I do when I start a patient on one of these drugs, um, perform therapies, is I say, look, if it's Saturday morning and you're not feeling well, you have permission to take a break. It's not going to harm the effectiveness if you take a couple of days off, and that might end up helping wash out some of the side effects of the drugs. And so what I ask of my patients is that they let us know they're going to take a, that they've taken a break. You, know, you can take the break first, let us know afterwards. And, and that way we can work together in sort of figuring out the individualized dose schedule that's best for each, individual, for each patient. Really, taking these drugs is a marathon, not a race. We need to make sure that we don't harm the normal cells in your body while we're trying to harm the tumor. So what about the immune, the new immune therapies? And before I go on to this, talk about this, I've just received an email from Dr. Campbell that unfortunately um, he needed to um, step out of the because of, of, of a family emergency. So I'm going to cover his slots, but he sends his, uh, his regards and his regrets that he's not going to be able to present these himself. So with these immune therapies uh, that we're using now, we are um, really doing some exciting new stuff. So when we have an infection or, or a virus or anything like that, our immune system, the T cell, which you see here on the right-hand side in the sort of peachy colored cell, will, will then attack particular cells that are presenting the right sort of proteins. And so here we have blue on the left, a tumor cell, we have a T cell, and, and you need to have a proper sort of handshake between the cells to make sure that these T cells, which are very, very potent, don't end up hurting the rock cells. And so we have in the middle here signal one, the green arrow, which is an antigen, which is a piece of protein, which is representative of this abnormal cell. And we have a signal two, which also needs to, to uh, go forward. And you need to both signals to turn on the T cell to kill the cancer cell. Then those are activating signals. 
Now, what's really important is that when we have our immune cells fighting bacteria or viruses or whatever, that they be turned off. And so we have inhibitory signals, which are good things, because we don't want to have our overactive immune system hurting us all the time. And these will signal through here we have PD-1, and we also have them signaling through CTLA-4. Now, the problem is that tumors can be really smart, or they evolve into expressing some of these down-regulatory signals as well, and that prevents the T-cells from attacking the tumor. So Dr. Um, Allison, who's now currently MD Anderson Cancer Center, has pioneered this idea of being able to essentially block the off switch on the immune cells. And we have some drugs that actually can do this, and they can block PD-1, and they can block CTLA-4. And there are some drugs that have been FDA approved now for melanoma and for lung cancer, and possibly at some point in the future for kidney cancer as well. There are some of these are examples of drugs being studied. We have nivolumab or Updevo. We have Keytruda or Pembrolizumab. We have MDPL 3280A, which just got a name, which I didn't include in here. And then we also have Yervoy or Ipilimumab. So these are some of these new drugs coming down the pipeline. And I'm very hopeful that we're going to be seeing these as treatments for kidney cancer at some point in the future. Um, an example was that there was a, a, a presentation uh, or a paper looking at uh, Updevo and Nivolumab in patients with kidney cancer who'd previously been treated with other therapies. And what we saw is that their progression-free survival was not that long, but that the overall survival in this group of individuals ended up actually being lower than we'd really been seen before in the past in patients who'd previously received therapy, like 25 months or so. And what was really exciting as well is there's a subset of individuals who had durable response, meaning they were shrunk down and stayed shrunk down for a long period of time. So what we want to figure out is, A, who are these people? Can we predict who those people are? And B, try to increase the number of people who have that type of response. A big trial that was complete last year, we're waiting for the results called Checkmate 25, where nivolumab or Obdivo was compared to Affinitor and people who had been previously treated. We hope to find out about it in the next six months or so. And there are a number of other clinical trials. There's a big phase three study of, of ipilimumab or, or, or Yervoy plus Obdivo versus Utent in untreated patients, and a number of other trials try, trying combinations. Uh, we also have a trial, a pre-surgical study currently open at MD Anderson, looking at the comparison between uh, um, Updevo versus Updevo plus Nivolumab, uh, sorry, with Yervoy versus um, Updevo plus Avastin, people who had not received prior therapy, and this is an ongoing study. So Dr. Campbell is about to become June faculty at MD Anderson Cancer Center, and, and we're really proud of him. He is a recipient of one of the ASCO Young Investigator Awards in 2015-2016, and there's a very small number of these, of these that are given out every year. So this is a real triumph, and we're very proud of what he's done. And this was on the basis of a, of a study where he's really looking at how to make these new antibodies, checkpoint antibodies, better. And this actually arose out of an observation that was made in one of my patients where this person had a, a, a tumor, which we then treated with ablation. I mean, we, we, we went in and we, 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 we killed that tumor with heat. And in so doing, well, basically here you can see the tumor, and I'm circling that. I hope you see, hopefully you see my pointer. Uh, we, we treated that with, with uh, heat therapy. And then the patient still had his primary kidney tumor in place, and we removed that a couple of months later. And when we took it out, to our tremendous surprise, that tumor was dead, and it was completely filled with immune cells. And so we were wondering whether by using this, this by, by killing the tumor in the sacrum, what we did, we actually released a lot of these antigens that are necessary to activate the immune cells, and whether this kind of approach of using sort of thermal therapy, either freezing or cooking or radiating the tumor, um, plus other treatments that actually end up being particularly helpful. And so the pro proposed mechanisms of action here is that when you have a, um, either a primary tumor or a metastatic tumor and you kill that tumor, proteins are released, which allows then these antigen-presenting cells that I've talked about, which are not necessarily tumor cells, but other cells, can then enhance the activation of T cells recognizing the proteins that are on the tumors, and that will then allow the tumor cells to be killed by the immune cells. And if we combine that then with turning off some of these off signals on, tumor, on the immune cells, this might be much more powerful. And so we have a clinical trial that's um, a, 
now now open and um, to test this, uh, where we're going to be looking at the combination of cryoablation at the beginning, uh, plus then uh, adding a, one of these checkpoint antibodies for a period of time to be able to see whether or not this results in, in further regression and in immune infiltrates into, into uh, uh, kidney cancer tumors. So the hypothesis here is that by pr we're going to be able to prime the immune system with cryoablation followed by antifi TLA or treatment. And the primary endpoints are to evaluate safety and the effects of this combination of checkpoint antibodies plus cryoablation. Now, research is fantastic and research is what moves things forward. But there's huge funding challenges. Uh, if you look at the the number of, of dollars that are that are being appropriated for uh, for um, uh, um, research, see that it's starting to plateau. And if you compare this to to 1995 dollars, which would be the dotted blue line here below, we see that it's going down. It's not going up. And so we're we're actually having a harder and harder time to be able to to fund research. And and if you look at the number of, of quote unquote competing competing awards that have been funded, we're seeing that again it's it's flatlining. And and with the explosion of information and the need to research, um, this is a huge challenge for us. So um, this work that Dr. Campbell is going to be doing has been through through the support of of Dr. Pam Sharma, who, who's the picture on the left, Sumit Sabuti, who's the picture in the middle, and J.J. Gao, who are, these are, they are our immunology um, uh, uh, crack team, and they really help in uh, preparing this, this, uh, this grant. So the last thing I'm going to talk about in the remaining minutes are hereditary renal cell carcinoma syndromes. So one of the big questions that we want to ask is, you know, one of the questions that my patients often ask me is, is this something that I'm going to be able to pass on to my kids? Or is this something that just was, was a, a, a bolt of lightning thing? And, and part of that will be answered by looking at the family history. You know, are other people in the family that have kidney cancer or not? But one of the other things we look at is the age of the person, because some of the things can be acquired in, in the germline or, or can, can exist in the germline of that patient only and not others. So just a quick sort of what are we talking about when we're talking about about something that's genetically inherited is of, instead of something that's in the tumor itself. All of us have um, 23 chromosome pairs, and here we have a nice picture of what we call a karyotype. And interestingly, the bigger the chromosome, the smaller the number. So chromosome 1 is the biggest one, which you see on the top left here, and then the smallest one is chromosome 22, and then we have the NY chromosome on the bottom as well. And each chromosome then is made up of a bunch of genes in the chromosome, and these chromosomes uh, and these genes will be throughout the, the chromosomes. There's hundreds and hundreds of genes that then would be translated into some sort of a protein or something like that. Now, we have two chromosomes, so we're going to have a gene on the left chromosome, and on the right chromosome, we have pairs of these, of these genes. And um, if you lose one of these genes, and you end up then starting to have a, um, a major problem, that means that that loss is a dominant, autosomal dominant loss, meaning that loss of one gene is enough to create disease manifestations, versus recessive meaning you need to lose both to create disease manifestations. In hereditary renal cell carcinoma syndromes, what you end up having is you end up having, um, lot, generally speaking, loss of just one copy of these genes, which is enough then to create a, a particular syndrome. And we have here a table, which is some of the most commonly studied ones, von hippel lindau disease, hereditary papillary renal cell carcinoma, hereditary leiomyomatosis renal cell carcinoma syndrome, and, and several others. And I'm going to talk about a couple of these um, in a bit more detail in the final few slides. One of the important things is that, for example, in BHL disease and papillary renal cell carcinoma hereditary syndromes and B BHD or Tau Dube, it's people who have this will have multiple tumors in each kidney. So it's not just one kid, one tumor at a time. You'll get cysts, you'll get tumors, and that's a quick way of sort of figuring out that hmm, this doesn't look like some sort of non-inherited phenomenon. Although there's one that's called HLRCT. Uh, where you can actually have single tumors. So, so this is something that, that we, as physicians, when we're thinking about inherited things, look at very closely. I'm going to go through a couple of these major disorders and then sort of talk at the end about whom should we screen. So VTL disease is one of these uh, diseases where we have loss of at least one copy of VHL for starters. 
And this will result then in eventual second gene, VHL gene loss in a number of different organs in the body, including the eye, the spine, the pancreas, the kidney. And you can get both tumors, cancer, and non-cancerous growth. Uh, and even the non-cancerous growth can be a major problem for these individuals. The next major one is type 1 papillary kidney cancer, where you will end up having a mutation in a, in a receptor um, called, called MET, the MET receptor is mutated in, in, in papillary renal cell carcinoma. And then these individuals will get multiple uh, tumors in, in, in both of their, in both of their, their kidneys. And, um, and what happens is you get multiple tumors that are, um, you get multiple um, um, copies of MET that are either increased or mutated, and that then causes a, a mutation. And this is something that will happen in papillary kidney cancer. And so as we talked about in hereditary papillary kidney cancer syndrome, you're going to end up getting um, multiple of these papillary tumors in both kidneys. Another syndrome is called berthog dubay syndrome. And this one is a, a very rare disorder, which is first described uh, back in 1977. You get a couple of thin spots. You get spontaneous pneumothoraxes, meaning that you get spontaneous lung collapse, as well as another different type of kidney cancers, chromophobe, clear cell, etc. And so this is another hereditary kidney cancer syndrome that we see in individuals. And here's an example of what happens in some of these individuals. You, get, you can get an oncocytoma and a chromophobe renal cell carcinoma, a variety of different tumors in the kidneys. And so and these are some of the skin manifestations that people will get, will get little bumps on the nose or on the skin. So the last one I'm going to talk about is HLRCC, or hereditary leiomyotosis renal cell carcinoma. And the important thing about this is this is individuals where family members will develop um, uterine leiomyomas, which are just basically fibroids. And if you have a big, strong family history of fibroids in the kidney, plus some leiomyomas on the skin, you, there's might be an inherited phenomenon. And about 10 to 20% of these individuals can develop type 2 papillary kidney cancer. So it's very important to recognize this syndrome. The, um, oh, there actually is one more. BAP1 familial syndrome uh, is, is the most recent of these familial syndromes. And so this is something that was recently described by Dr. Jim Brigarolis. And uh, he asked the question, why is it that there seems to be family clustering of individuals who have clear cell kidney cancer but don't have uh, mutations in the, um, um, in, in the VHL gene? And it looks like there's this other mutation in the BAP1 gene which can also cause a kidney cancer, a clear cell kidney cancer formation. What we're um, doing now is individuals who have um, any of these syndromes that we sort of realize is something that looks very much like one of these um, one of the hereditary syndromes and people who are younger than 46 we we say that these people should be referred for genetic testing so in summary uh, what we have is we have um, approaches to to first line second line and third line treatments for metastatic kidney cancer um, and I think the take-home message here is that we have a lot of good options, but it's important to you know, follow the guidelines, but also it's important to keep trying different drugs. If one doesn't work, try to move on to another one. The second is that each of these therapies have their advantages and disadvantages from a side effect profile perspective. And it's really, really important that we you talk to your doctors about the side effects, that your doctor, doctors talk to you about the side effects, and that we empower the patient. Um, the next point is that we have some very exciting new drugs coming down pipeline with these checkpoint inhibiting antibodies. Over the next decade, I predict we're going to be figuring out how do we use these drugs? Who can get them? Who shouldn't get them? How do we combine them with other things? And, and as you saw from Dr. Campbell's uh, work, uh, we have some really exciting ideas on how to actually maximize the potential for the agents. And the last point is then genetic kidney cancer syndromes. You know, who needs to be tested for these? Obviously, if you have a constellation of, of symptoms and findings that, that really fit in the box of one of these hereditary syndromes, that's uh, really, really important. But if you don't have any of these and you're diagnosed with kidney cancer before the age of 46, we also, again, recommend uh, uh, some sort of genetic testing and genetic counseling.
So these are my slides. I really want to thank you very much for taking the time to listening, and I'd be very happy at this point in time to field questions um, to uh, regarding uh, my, my presentation or any other questions that might come up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Gilnash, and I have a question for you, sir. Um, are there any thoughts or data on diet with respect to cancer, particularly things like the ketogenic diets? So the the data on, on diet are that it's important and it's important to have a good diet. Uh, my my opinion on this, and, and I believe that of, of most people in the field, is that that specific types of diets, generally, um, especially if they're fad type of diets, are not ultimately going to be very helpful for you. So there's there's a a fallacy out there that quote unquote sugar feeds the tumor. Well, yes. Sugar does feed tumors, but it also feeds your brain. So the brain is actually the largest consumer of glucose in the body. So if you try to lower the glucose level in your bloodstream, the first thing you're going to starve is your brain. And and so the amount of sugar that's in your bloodstream is actually very carefully regulated by your pancreas. And and so so the 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 um, high sugar versus low sugar diet in of itself doesn't directly have a negative effect on the cancer, but it does have an effect on, on other organs in your body if you're not eating a healthy diet. So what I recommend is a very well, a well balanced, quote unquote, um, um, normal diet where you have a, a proper mixture of proteins and, and starches um, and, and, and vitamins and uh, eat regularly throughout the day. So you, you, shouldn't, you shouldn't try to, quote unquote, starve your tumor because you're going to end up disturbing your own body. Okay, thank you for that answer, sir. Uh, is there any clinical evidence for the effectiveness of the FDA-approved drugs for people that are currently on dialysis? So there are several studies that have been done, small studies. So first of all, uh, most of these drugs are, are um, tolerated in individuals who are on dialysis uh, and, and pretty much in the same dosage that, that you would give to a person who's not on dialysis. And number two, they do seem to work um, reasonably well. So there are small, uh, what I would call retrospective studies that, that demonstrate that. Plus, um, I can just tell you from my, my personal experience with my patients, I have a number of individuals who are on dialysis, who are on these agents, and are enjoying their benefits. Is partial nephrectomy as effective as a radical nephrectomy for treating small VHL-related clear cell kidney humors? The answer is absolutely yes. So, in general, partial nephrectomies are have been shown over the years in the um, in the non VHL patient population to be uh, as as technically effective in terms of preventing recurrence um, around the remaining kidney tissue, and also from the standpoint of metastasis, the, the same number of metastases occur in people who get a radical nephrectomy versus a partial nephrectomy. In the VHL patient population and in the hereditary kidney cancer population, it's critically important that, that we preserve kidney function as much as possible, because if you're developing multiple tumors over the years and over the decades, what we, what we try to, are trying to do as hard as possible to prevent you from going on dialysis. And so using um, partial nephrectomies, sometimes using cryoablation or radiofrequency ablation, uh, we, we can try to, to minimize the growth of these um, tumors as much as possible so that they don't exceed three centimeters, which is our usually established threshold, uh, and, and maintaining, uh, maintaining kidney function. One of the other strategies that we're starting to use in the situation also is to use drugs. So we currently have a, a research study actually where we're where we're testing the utility of using Votrient or Zopinib as a means to decrease the growth rate of these tumors in individuals with VHL disease who have multiple tumors in their kidneys. And this seems to be an, an interesting strategy that, that may be providing benefit in a subset of individuals. Thank you, Dr. Yonash. Now, uh, along the same lines, what is the recommended surveillance period for uh, VHL-related uh, tumor patients? So patients who have VHL disease, they need to have, uh, we recommend that there, there be, by and large, annual surveillance. So what the VHL uh, Alliance recommendations are is that, that for uh, 
the brain, so the, the, the brain, the, the cerebellum and the spine, you don't have any tumors in there that MRIs be done in that area every two years. If you do have spots in there, probably every year. In the kidney and the pancreas and that, generally we want to do scans every year. And we try to do MRIs as much as possible to diminish, decrease radiation. Ophthalmologic or eye evaluation you want to do annually, hearing evaluation you want to do annually. In individuals who have absolutely nothing over decades and decades, maybe then you start doing things every two years or so. But that one to two year window of checking up on these things is what we certainly consider to be, be a standard here. Okay, and in the generally approved drugs, uh, do any of those drugs seem to cause the tumors to grow versus shrink? Not that we've seen. So, so I've treated uh, hundreds, if not thousands, of individuals with metastatic kidney cancer over the years. And in terms of these approved drugs actually looking like they're, they're fueling the tumor growth, I've not seen that. I've seen that in a set of individuals, unfortunately, these drugs are not effective at stemming growth, but I've not really seen these approved agents uh, hastening growth. But obviously, maybe this is somewhere out there, but I'm not aware of it. Um, so I would say at this point in time, pretty much uh, the answer is uh, no. And with the new immunotherapeutic agents, uh, what are some of the side effects that people are experiencing with them? So... By and large, you look at large studies, they're fairly well tolerated, but there are a couple of key things that you need to look out for. And since Optiv or Nivolumab may be one of the first drugs that we're going to be seeing approved, I'll focus on that. So what these drugs can do is they can cause the, the immune system to start reacting against particular organs in the body. Main things that people will notice is they might start noticing diarrhea. And that diarrhea is because of an irritation of the intestinal tract by the immune system itself. The other thing that you can see is you can see an inflammation of the lung tissue, a pneumonitis. The other thing you can see is you can see um, inflammation of the liver or, or a hepatitis. And so these are the sorts of things that can be seen. And it's, once again, in terms of the, the, the need to communicate with doctors, if, you have, if there are any people out there who are on clinical trials with these agents, they'll know that, that it's so essential, and it's been, it's been reiterated so many times, it's so essential to communicate with the treating team if any of these side effects are to occur. Because the main treatment, if these were to occur, is to start what we call steroids, which are an immune suppressant type of therapy others maybe have been have used for for you know uh, various um, various other inflammatory processes but steroids are very effective at cooling down the immune system so so those are the major side effects it's because the immune system starts to react against the body and we need to know about it right away so we can start reacting against the reaction thank you dr yonash uh one question that, that comes up quite frequently, what do you recommend that your patients do uh, as far as uh, taking notes and uh, being able to communicate with you when they come into the clinic? I think being, being organized with regards to what are the key problems that have arisen uh, during that cycle of therapy or, or that period of observation, um, writing things down is, is very helpful. Because I, I know that I sometimes kind of get frozen up in, when I when I'm in a situation where I'm I'm not feeling completely comfortable. I'm feeling a little bit anxious. The other thing is bringing a person with you. You know, having a having a um, a, a family member or a friend who who really knows the situation. More the more ears the better. Uh, and and the more sort of people thinking about this, the better. So I think you know having a team of people who are, are having your, your your healthcare supporters come with you, and also writing things down um, is is perfectly fine. I mean we're the physicians and 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 the the nurse practitioners and nurses, um, everyone's there to help, and um, we we like to hear questions, and and we want to make sure that you have those questions answered. For a person that's going on to a second or third line of, of treatment, um, is is that indicative that uh, uh, the treatment people are giving up hope, or uh, is there possibilities or good responses on the second or third line of treatment? Well, as as we saw from some of some of the data, that people who are in third, second and third lines of treatment, they're they're doing they're, they can do very very well. 
I have to be honest that the first line treatment tends to be the one that lasts the longest and provides the, the largest amount of benefit. There's clearly a subset of individuals who are receiving second line and third line therapy who derive major benefit. And and this is why, you know, I really strongly advocate you know, keep the positive attitude, keep on trying, keep on keep on looking for possibilities, keep on looking for clinical trials because you know there there's there's a subset of individuals now that that uh, that are long term survivors who are living with, with, with metastatic kidney cancer. So so um, uh, keep 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 trying those different agents. And even though you didn't mention IL two uh, or interleukin two, are you still considering that to be a viable treatment option for some patients? That's a great question, and uh, I did not talk about that in great detail. Uh, IL two certainly still can be thought about, and in, in, in the archetypal, the best sort of sort of individual will be somebody who's younger because it's a treatment that actually can be fairly tough on the body. People who have clear cell kidney cancer but lower lower grade, so not a not a grade three or grade four, not sarcomatoid, and individuals have, for example, relatively small burden of disease mainly in the lung lymph nodes. That would be the ideal sort of person to think about that. And there's, there's no question, if you look at the data with high dose IL-2, there's about 5% or so people who, uh, who have long-term major, major responses. So, you know, what we, uh, you know, for all tenses and purposes, a cure. So um, how big is that number of, of, of quote-unquote, cure the anti-angiogenic agents? Um, it's perhaps a little bit lower. So, so for those individuals who, who want to go through that at this point in time, um, it's certainly, um, certainly something that, that should be discussed. Thank you for that answer. And since, uh, since Lutin appears to be better tolerant, are any of the other approved medications being looked at for similar improvements uh, in modifying their schedule? So, um, not as much because with Sutent, it seemed that the, the schedule uh, and it was more schedule and dose dependent than uh, than, than any of the other um, any of the other agents. So, um, so no, we um, uh, I personally will recommend for patients to 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 take a break for. Um, uh, on whether they're on on Vitriant or in Lida, you know, if you really start finding the side effects catching up to you, take a couple of days off. I mean, we clearly say that to patients. We we do that for Affinitor as well. Um, that time off where you're letting your normal cells in your body heal probably pays huge dividends with regards to how long you can stay on on the drug. Now, in terms of formal studies uh, with any of these other agents, uh, changing schedule, um, really not so much. I think it's kind of more sort of in a, in a, um, in a case-by-case basis right now, but it's probably an idea that, that, uh, that needs to be considered for other treatments as well. And if clear cell carcinoma spreads, uh, where does it tend to go uh, in other parts of the body primarily? Most common place for it to spread to include the lungs, lymph node, and bone. And less common to see it um, go to the liver, um, other internal um, um, organs, intra-abdominal organs, and then relatively rarely uh, to the brain. Um, so the, the scanning strategy that we use, we, we will, uh, when a person comes in metastatic uh, kidney cancer, we will want to look at the brain at the beginning just to make sure there isn't anything lurking there. Uh, and then uh, we want to do a bone scan. And, and I recommend then moving forward doing a, a brain MRI once a year or so. That's now actually built into the NCCN guidelines. That uh, That's something that, that should be considered um, just to ensure that, that um, something is growing slowly in that area, that you can see it early and you can then treat it maybe with focus beam or your tactic radio surgery. Um, and, and then obviously the scans to look at the lungs, lymph node, and bone. Uh, the CT scans are going to be very good for following up those areas. And what is your current thinking on you, the use of PET scans uh, in diagnostic imaging? So PET scans for kidney cancer perhaps are, are somewhat less reliable. Um, they um, Sometimes a PET scan, uh, the way a PET scan works is, is that Cancer cells are kind of the SUVs of the of, of the cancer world of the of the cellular world. They use a lot of um, they use a lot of sugar, and um, so you sort of see them with 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 radioactive sugar. But sometimes they don't, and and there you can have you can have um, um, 
tumors that will, will be kind of um, lit up a lot versus tumors that don't. And if you use a PET CT, that sometimes can give you the false sense security that the spots you see are, are not tumors. So we, we tend not to use it that much. Hey, Dr. Yonak, and we have one final question for you, sir. Uh, while on Votriant treatment, what test needs to be constantly monitored? So the major thing you need to check with Votriant is liver tests. So the first eight weeks, um, the official thing to do is to look at to look at liver function tests, week one, week three, week five, week seven. Um, that's what's written in the label. I frankly do it every two. I do it two week two, four, six, eight, um, because we usually see patients back after eight weeks. Because there's a small percentage of individuals where there can be there can be a rapid rise in uh, in, in liver tests, and uh, and it needs to be monitored very closely. And after eight weeks, if that does not really show up, then you can back off to doing the liver tests every month. So that's the major differentiating factor uh, with Votriant. Thank you, Dr. Yonash, and, and we would like to express our appreciation for your participation as well as the entire MD Anderson uh, team in the, in the kidney cancer area for getting these slides together. Uh, we'll send a recording of the program to everyone by email so that you can view it in its entirety. In the meantime, we, we remind you to take advantage of the wonderful insights and support of the KCA Inspire Support Community at kidneycancer.inspire.com. Thank you for listening and viewing.